This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Page 7, Stakeholders. This is again based on Campbell's article from 2009. Stakeholders, anyone or any group. This is as they are. We're all of us stakeholders in everything. Everything you do, whenever you do it, think of me. When you're cooking your dinner this evening, I am a stakeholder in your activities. When you're getting on that tram to go home, I'm a stakeholder because you were using resources to drive the tram and that affects me because there's fewer resources available now for me to use. We're all of us stakeholders in everything that everybody else does. It's just amazing. Just Your mind just probably can't take it all in. I can't. But there are people in Japan at this moment who are claiming pensions on behalf of their grandfather who died 30 years ago and they're still claiming the social benefits from it. Did you, have you been reading about that? Oh dear, what do you do? The um, Japanese, it's come to light that people in, in Japan have been claiming for the, the pensions from the state for their old relatives and their old relatives, it was announced on the radio that Japan's oldest man aged 115 has died, but then it said apparently he died 30 years ago, but nobody told the authorities. So the family's been claiming the pension for 30 years, and there's been a big, a big um, investigation. And about a week later, it says we've sad news that the Japan's oldest woman has also died 40 years ago. And one man has put his mother, he's cut his mother up and, and put her in plastic bags. Uh, because it was easier to keep her there than keep her lying in the bed. And, and she's also died a number... She was dead at the time when he cut her up. Uh, and there have been hundreds, apparently, hundreds of Japanese people who have been claiming social benefits on behalf of their dead relatives. How did I get there? How did I get to that? What was it that made me think of Japan and old people? I can't. I don't know. Stakeholders. Campbell's article says you can subdivide stakeholders. There have been a number of subdivisions identified. I would imagine, not by Campbell himself, but by university students who have been writing theses about who are the stakeholders and how we can subcategorize them. And you've got here eight different possibilities of subdivisions of, of stakeholders. Primary or secondary a primary stakeholder would, for instance, be a director or shareholder, employee, customer, supplier. But secondary stakeholders are the families and the shopkeepers who rely for their livelihood on the money being paid to them by these employees. A secondary shareholder may be the uh, secondary stakeholder, may be the car manufacturer who makes the car that the director is going to buy next year and he can afford to buy it because of his remuneration through the company. So a secondary stakeholder is not one who is immediately affected. Internal or external? Internal ones again, directors, employees. External? Well, the government, the tax authorities, and you and me. We're external, we're external shareholders to your national telephone company, external stakeholders. Narrow or wide, uh, people who have a very narrow interest, people have a much wider interest. So you can identify, the narrow interest ones would include, again, the employees. They're only interested specifically in what their employer company is doing. They have only a narrow interest in it. But a greater, wider interest is me, because if your company cheats and evades taxation, then it means that there is not enough state revenue flowing into the state for them to finance their state obligations. So then they raise the taxes and I have to pay more tax because you're not paying enough. Well, that's why I'm a wide stakeholder. Known or unknown, the known ones are the ones that we can identify. The known ones are specifically the, the customers, the suppliers, but unknowns, the as yet undiscovered creatures of the deep. 
these fish that we don't know about, these people who claim to have a stake in our activities, but they've never made themselves known to us. Legitimate or illegitimate? The directors running the strategy of the company, the directors have to recognize the interests of these stakeholders and have to strike a balance. Clearly the important ones are keep the employees happy, keep the customers happy, keep the shareholders happy. But there are other people who claim to have a legitimate interest, but we don't think their interest is legitimate. Why should I pay attention to some people in the deserts of North Africa? Why should I have to recognize the legitimacy of their claim? So legitimate and illegitimate is really the subjective opinion of the, the, the directors, the people in control. But then if you just take that one small step again, can you not see that all people do have a legitimate interest in the wider context? <clears throat> when the extremists flew their aeroplanes into the World Trade Center, when the leaders of the, and I don't want to get anti-religious here, but when the leaders of one religious group of people claim that theirs is the only true way, and therefore everybody else is wrong, they must believe that by their actions they are acting legitimately. But from my point of view, it would seem that I could easily arrive at the conclusion that says, no, they're not acting legitimately. They are wrong to pursue this ideal that they have. And their ideals and my ideals are going to be so radically different that I'm going to think that what they're doing is, is not justified, whereas they think that their actions are justified. So you've got this, this, this divergence of opinion and divergence of attitude. Legitimate or illegitimate? Active or passive? An active interest or a passive interest? The taxman doesn't normally take an active interest in the activities of a company. And, and people in distant places don't normally take it. The trees and the as yet undiscovered creatures of the deep don't take an active interest in the activities of a company. So although they're stakeholders, they're passive. They're, they're not directly involved, whereas shareholders, uh, employees, directors, customers, they are actively involved. They're not passive. Voluntary or involuntary? Do these as yet undiscovered creatures of the deep, are they voluntary stakeholders in the activities of your employer? Involuntary. They're involuntary, aren't they? It's not their fault that your employer is in business. They are a stakeholder, but they didn't volunteer to be a stakeholder, whereas employees are voluntary. It's up to them whether they want to continue being an active participant in the company's activities. And if they choose not to be, uh, then they can voluntarily leave. I think actually they are also involuntary, they're both. Go on. It doesn't matter if well, they live on this planet or anything. Well, on the basis that even if they do leave the employment, they're still a stakeholder, but they're no longer an active one. Yes, okay. But the, um, the trees aren't. The trees and the birds, they're involuntary, aren't they? They can't help it. They, they have to be stakeholders because we do affect them. So they would be involuntary stakeholders. Recognized or unrecognized? Recognition, the legitimacy. Do I recognize your claim to be, uh, to be a stakeholder in my organization? Or do I say not? Now, I'm quite happy to say that we ought to recognize everyone and everything. I'm quite happy to say that, that stakeholders, everything is a recognized stakeholder. We ought to recognize them as such. But this is a subdivision that's given to us. What was the name of that, uh, that volcano in Iceland that, that stopped the aeroplanes? Do you remember the name of the volcano? It's, very it's not a complicated name, not if you're Icelandic, it's not a complicated name. I, I seem to remember it's called Ejaf Jalajokul. I think. And when Ejaf Jalajokul exploded and all the ash came out, what else came out? What was the pink stuff at the top that came out? What, what's that? What's that? It's basically stone. What's the stone? It's liquid stone. What's it called? Lava. Lava, yeah. 
And look at this. You've got there, you've got, if I can get my pen to work, pink lava. It's spelt L-A-V-R, unfortunately. I couldn't make it L-A-V-A. But you've got pink lava, primary or secondary, internal, external, narrow, wide, known or unknown, legitimate, illegitimate, active, passive, voluntary, involuntary, and recognized, unrecognized. So now we've got two mnemonics that we're going to have to remember. What was the first one? Talk me through it. Go on, talk me through hair drift. And then just the first one. Honesty. 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 A? Accountability. I'm asking this one here. I, I can only ever be one of two things. And in fact we've got two eyes in it, so the... They're both yeah, of them in it. Integrity is one. one. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. R. The responsibility. D. Decision. Decision making and judgment. R. Something that John has a good one. Reputation. I. The other one. It's what you, particularly you of all of you in the room, it's what you or a characteristic that you should possess in the course of your employment. I should avoid the conflicts of... No, that's not... That's, that's, <laughs> that doesn't... Nowhere is there. Is there a, a word beginning with I? Oh, yes, there is. I should avoid. Independence. No. Independence. Uh, F. Fairness. Fairness. And T. Transparency. Transparency. All right. Remuneration, no, no, not into the remuneration mnemonic yet. Stakeholders may be subclassified as being having an operational role within the entity or a role in corporate governance. So we've got another possibility. Some stakeholders have a role to play and others have a role in the context of corporate governance. And some have both, people like directors, and the secretary, the second tier management, employees, unions, accountants. So for the internal interests, which is what we've got down on the bottom of page 7, for those with an internal interest, how do these people, we'll not go through them all, but how do directors have a role to play in corporate governance and an operational role within the entity? What's their operational role of a director in the company? Come on, this is obvious. This is so obvious. The operational role of directors in the running of the company, they run the company. They, they, they dictate its strategy. So they clearly have an operational role within the company. What about a role in corporate governance? What are the elements of corporate governance? What are the elements of corporate governance? What are the elements of corporate governance? Hairdrift. Yeah, hair drift of the elements. And directors have a role there, don't they? They have to act honestly, they have to act responsibly, they have to be accountable, they have to... and so on. So they have a, an operational role because they run the company, but they also have a role in corporate governance. What about employees? Well, Mr. Secretary and the second tier manager, what about employees? Do you see that we're working down here in terms of importance of people involved. The directors are clearly involved. The company secretary is an officer of the company and, and does have a role in corporate governance to make sure that the directors comply with corporate governance. But they also have an operational role because they are responsible for signing some contracts or declaring some matters to the relevant authorities for signing forms and filing accounts. So the company secretary has an operational role as well as a, a corporate governance role. The second tier management, these are the people who tend to be the purchasing manager or the sales or the human resource manager. If they're not on the board of directors, they're second tier management. <coughs> and their operational role is that the directors will determine strategy, but they're not then involved in the tactics. So the tactical operational elements will be the responsibility of the second tier management. 
we know what the director's overall objectives are, now it's up to second tier management to take action to achieve those objectives. Employees though, what about employees? You do employees. What sort of operational role do employees have? To work. Who? They work, yeah. But it's, it's the tactics which are determined by the second tier management. It's the operational element which is achieved by the employees. So they're the ones who ensure quality and the goods. They're the person sitting at the end of the production line picking off the, the burnt cornflakes as they, as they pass down the production line. They're the, they're the ones who actually put into practice the tactics which are there to determine and achieve the strategy. So the top guys appear to establish strategy, second tier establish the tactics of how we're going to achieve that strategy, but the actual operational role is carried out by the employees, the workers. What's their role in corporate governance? Um, a system whereby a company is directed and controlled. What's the role of the employees in corporate governance? Open your mind. Corporate governance, this method, this system, where a company is directed and controlled, is the responsibility of the directors. They're the ones who establish that this is what we shall do. So we're going to set up a set of guidelines within the company. But it's all right setting up these guidelines within the company. The people who are going to apply the guidelines are these employees. They're the ones who are going to apply the guide. They're the ones who are going to ensure that uh, we do put in the correct mixture of component elements when we're producing a, a mixed product. So when you're producing concrete, for instance, if you're producing beton, it should be in the ratio of four to two to one. It should be four lots of stone and two lots of sand and one lot of cement. Well, if you don't put the right quantities in, if you put too little cement, if you make it in the, the ratio of six to three to one, then there's not enough cement in there and so the concrete is then poor quality. But it saves money because we don't need to use, use as much cement. So, if Agnesa, for instance, were to see Vinetta putting in the wrong quantity of cement, uh, then Agnesa should tell someone. It's no good telling Vinetta or, or Aldis here, it's no good telling Aldis that he's putting the wrong quantity of cement in. Uh, she should be telling someone in authority. She should be going to the directors. And, and the action that she takes is known as the action that you take when you when you when you're telling tales about uh, yeah when you're telling tales about your colleagues, the action is called whistleblowing. And one of the roles of the non-executive directors is that they should provide an ear for the whistleblower. They should they should let it be known that if I see or sorry if you see one of your colleagues or you see one of your colleagues operating against the rules of the company, the internal guidelines of the company you should be prepared and willing and happy to come and tell me. Why? Because then I can take action. But why should you tell me? Why should you tell me? Because if she's mixing concrete wrong, it's unsafe concrete. And there's a lot of damage and reputation that's then potentially at risk. You should tell me because if the company's reputation goes down, uh, then we begin to lose market share. We get all sorts of scandals. The promoting the success of the company disappears. And the value of the company. And if the value of the company goes down, and the long-term prospects of the company disappear, then you're going to lose your job. And we're all going to lose our job. And it's in the interest of society uh, that the rules are followed. So whistleblowing is an important thing. And I can understand people being very reluctant to blow the whistle. Because... You work alongside each other and you see that the person sitting at the next desk, the person standing at the next machine, the person putting the cement into the mixer is doing it wrong and they're a friend and you go drinking with them and you visit each other's homes and you've been on holiday with them, with them and their families. And, and you're now saying, 
I'm going to tell on you. I'm going to tell the board of directors that you're not putting enough cement in this mixture. I can understand reluctance. But then the bigger issue is they have to be told. Even if you tell that, even if you were to, to turn around to Aldis and say, Aldis, you're putting the wrong stuff in there. And Aldis says, I know, but I can't be bothered. I'm a little bit lazy. I don't want to lift another bag of cement. Even if you tell him, you should still be telling the directors as well. Do you? Have you ever blown the whistle? I'm sure in your firm there's never been an occasion where, where any of your colleagues has broken their rules. But that's, that's important. So they have a role in corporate governance. The unions clearly do as well. The external stakeholder, they have a role to play as well. A role to play in influencing the operations of the entity. But they also have their own claims and their own interests. They also have their own claims and their own interests. Consider these then in the context of auditors. You've got a, a role to play in influencing the operations of the entity. Let's ask one of you auditors. Um, Ilza. What, what role do you play in influencing the, the uh, operations of the company? It depends which kind of auditors we are. Well, you're good auditors. We can, uh, no, if we audit uh, financial statements or uh, we are here to increase the quality of the product they produce. Yes. No. Yeah, you're influencing the quality of the product if you're auditing the financial statements. Yeah. Controls better, like, uh... You're influencing compliance with IFRS and compliance with law. You're influencing the fact that if the company is apparently in breach of legislation, then they're facing potential penalties, and you're influencing this by persuading the directors that, in fact, if they were to pursue this course of action, then they would be in breach, and then you've got to consider provisioning for, um, for penalties. Um, you're influencing them in the compliance element where even with something like IFRS they have to comply with them. So you're influencing that. You're influencing them in persuading them not to make misleading statements within anywhere within the financial statements. So you do have an influence there. You also influence them with reference to recommendations about strengthening their systems so that they have a, a more sound system of internal control than they might otherwise have. You can improve and help to improve and recommend improvements to their uh, internal systems. So you do certainly have an influence there. What about your own interests and your own claims? What about an auditor's own interests? Auditors have a, an influence on the operations of the company, but they also have their own interests with reference to the company. What's their own interests? The fee. Yeah, the audit fee. Uh, and your reputation. You want to be associated, as an auditors, you would want to be associated with leading companies within your country. So uh, I can see that it is in your interest to help to develop your own reputation. And if you do develop your own reputation, then it's almost automatic that people who are making a decision for themselves to pursue a career in accountancy or auditing, they're not going to particularly likely go to the audit firms with a poor reputation. They're going to go to the audit firms with a good reputation, like any of the big four. <coughs> Regulators, government, stock exchange. Let's have a look at stock exchange. Unless you want to look at any of the other small investors, institutional investors. What's an institutional investor? What is an institutional investor? Oh yeah, a big investor, and I don't mean a big fat investor, I mean, what, give me an example of a big investor. And doesn't put, the one I've got immediately in my mind is not particularly applicable in this part of the world, but it is becoming, I believe, it is becoming applicable in this part of the world. What's the big argument in France at the moment? 
Yeah, about pensions and the pension funds, the people to whom you young people will pay your money so that they can invest it and make it grow, the pension funds are getting all this money in from the people who are members of that fund and they have to invest, or they don't have to, but they're likely to invest that money in companies of good reputation, hoping that the companies will make the value grow so that your money has now grown in the hands of the pension funds. And there was a guy on open tuition last night who was really upset about the activities, I think it was the Royal Bank of Scotland he was upset about, no, Lloyds Bank, um, because by their careless and reckless investments the value of his pension had fallen. Uh, so he's really not happy at all about that. So the pension funds, they're the big investors. They are, the, well, they are an example of big investors. Um, we just had one on the internal bit, the last one on the internal list on the previous page. Trade unions. The trade unions are also big investors. There's organizations called Investors in Industry. Investors in Industry, three I's. They are institutional investors. <coughs> And they clearly have a role to play, the institutional investors clearly have a role to play in the operations of the company. The role that they play is that because they are big investors and because therefore they have influence, they therefore also have not necessarily direct or immediate power to remove directors, but they have sufficient power to make the directors worried. Somebody who owns 5 or 10 percent of a public company, they clearly have to be paid attention to. The directors of your national telephone company will clearly pay attention. The directors of your national airline will clearly pay attention to the interests of one particular hair flick, won't they? On the basis that he's a major investor. I know he's also a director, but he's a major investor. So they clearly have an, an influence on the operations of the company, but in addition they also have their own interests at heart. Thinking again about your national airline, he's obviously got his own interests at heart. His own interests being measured at something, what, 80,000 a month? You may not be able to answer because you may be the auditor of it, I don't know. But 80,000 a month, was that not what was declared on 31st December last year? Uh, that this 49% shareholder director was getting 80,000 of your local currency each month? I think it was. You're looking at me like I'm about to ask you to breach some confidential information. Uh, I think it was 80,000 he's getting. That's what he did, declared to the authorities reluctantly. He didn't want to have to declare it. So, their own interests, auditors clearly have their own interests, regulators do. Uh, the government has its own interest, collecting tax from the company. Uh, stock exchange do, because if it's a quoted company, it has to pay. I think in the UK, I'm, I may be wrong with the figure, I think in the UK a public company has to pay £750,000 a year to the stock exchange for the benefit of having its shares quoted. I, th I think I'm right with the figure, but I may be wrong. Small investors, this is an interesting one. Does a small investor have a role to play in influencing the operations of a company? Who's a small investor? It's not a pension fund, not a trade union, not an insurance company. Give me an example of a small investor. Please. Me. I'm a small investor. The amount of money that I can possibly invest in any company is severely limited by the limited amount that John pays me on a, an irregular and infrequent basis. So I don't have a lot of disposable income. But any that I do have, I may invest. What sort of influence do I have on the operations of my invested company? Pretty much zero. I'm pretty, I'm re but if I get together with you and you and you and you and you and you, if I get together and we all get together, then a small investor becomes a bigger investor group and then we can think about influence in the company. So just because I happen to be a small investor doesn't mean that I will always be a small investor. Yeah, but you can go to the shareholders and you'll meeting and speak. 
I can, yeah, I can go to the shareholders meeting and I can speak and join in discussions and ask the chair direct questions. What sort of reaction do you think the board of directors is going to have when I stand up and say, excuse me chair, you don't know me but I own 14 shares in your company. Oh, sit down. No, they have to encourage me to participate in meetings. It is a requirement that they should encourage me to participate in general meetings of the company. But there's me with my 14 shares and there's the pension fund representative with his 10% of the shares of the company and who's the chair going to listen to? There has to be a balance and the balance is, I'm sorry Mike, but you don't have enough shares for us to be bothered. If you don't like what we're doing, sell your shares. Yes, we'll pay certain attention to you because you own 10% and if, if you don't like what we're doing, then you're potentially going to suggest that we should be removed from office. So we'll pay attention to you. It is a requirement of law in the UK that these big shareholders should act in the best interests of all the shareholders. So they should bear in mind the interests of the small people like me when they're making their proposals and voting on their resolutions. It's a requirement of law that the bigger shareholders shall bear in mind the interests of the smaller shareholders.